Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Dr. Tanisha Freeman Foster. Welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to, to participate on the oh, show today. I'm so excited about this. So tell everybody why you're here. Tell everybody about the book. Yes. Yeah, so thank you so much. So I just recently published a book, my first book, um, Navigating Rough Seas. And the C stands for Soul Eroding Assimilation Forcing Systems. And it is a playbook of reclaiming your power, your wellness, and your joy as you navigate traumatic workplaces or dysfunctional workplaces. Okay. So what, what got you to write this book? Obviously there is some background there. <laughs> yes. So first it has been my experience and I, and I, I will say I've been in leadership for most of my career. So as a leader, I've been able to navigate various spaces. And I will say overall, my experiences have been more positive than negative. Um, but I also understand the impact of leadership and the impact of organizational culture on individuals, whether that is individuals that are working or clients. And so I've seen both. I also have done my, I did my dissertation in organizational culture and how it impacts individuals who are living with HIV and AIDS, their um, decision to take their medication or, or attend their doctor's appointments. And so what I've found from those focus groups is that if people came into their appointments and they maybe had an appointment at 12 noon and they weren't seen until one or later and people, no one came out and said, hey, like we're going to, we're running a few minutes late right. or this, they would take that as their lives didn't matter. And in turn, they would stop taking their medication. They would stop going to those appointments and they would essentially give up on life. And so I, and seeing that, I think it just cemented for me the power that leaders have to make a difference in individuals' lives, something such so small as right. we're running late and we'll get back to you made a life or death difference for people. Also in the workplace, I've seen with individuals of various races and, and genders, but especially Black women who are navigating workplaces that are traumatic, where they don't feel seen, where they don't feel heard, and where they don't feel celebrated, and the impact that that has on individuals' lives, not only at work, but in their personal lives. And we've seen a number of individuals who have died by suicide as a result of workplace bullying, as a result of feeling disrespected at work or feeling stuck in a job that was um, continuously eroding at them, eroding at their soul, eroding at their spirit. And so my goal with this book is to amplify that, to amplify what's going on in the workplace as leaders to individual staff and also as leaders to clients to really elevate these are this is what's going on and you have the power to do better you have an obligation to do better but also to black women and other individuals who are navigating this making sure they feel seen and heard because a lot of times a lot of the the trauma and a lot of the the debilitation that comes from that environment is thinking that you're the only one thinking mm -hmm. that you're alone, thinking that it must be a figment of your imagination and also that you should just be glad for a paycheck. Mm -hmm. And so in exchange, you um, allow these things to go on because you that's the way you eat. That's the way you take care of your family. And again, if you think you're the only one, that plays in your mind of maybe if I just do this a little differently or maybe if I just be quiet or maybe if I present like this, it'll get better. And really it doesn't because there's yeah. a, a real pathology behind the individuals who are doing this to other people. And so that is the goal of the book to really amplify that message and to let people know that they are not alone. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, and everybody as human beings, we want to feel validated and seen. Absolutely. I would rather be bullied then feel like I am, uh, nobody sees me in a room or ignores what I say, or that what I say doesn't matter. Like that is so belittling and can make people feel so small. And until I saw the subject matter of your book, I did not realize that that was something that was, that was so rampant, you know, um, Absolutely. did, did COVID change anything for that? 
I think it's a yes and a no. I think there are, there are many layers to this. So I think in terms of an increase, I wouldn't say so much an increase. I think this has been something that's been going on. I think COVID, because so many people were affected by COVID, and I know as a Black woman in our Black and Brown communities, there were so many people who are experiencing the remnants of COVID, but that lost their lives to COVID. And so mm -hmm. I think that shifted people into a mindset of you only live once and what quality of life looks like where before it was work, work, work. And it's like, wait, there's something in between life and death and it's called suffering. And if I don't have to suffer, I am not going to choose that. And so I think people, a new glimpse of life could be how short and how precious life is. So I think with that, it prompted people to start speaking up, to not suffer in silence anymore and to really take a step back. I've seen a lot of people who've left their jobs without other work and just really prioritizing their health and well-being and knowing that life is so short and life is so precious. Do you want to sacrifice your well-being for a paycheck? And a lot of people are now saying, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So I think COVID did that. I think also COVID provided a reprieve for some people who were able to work from home and who mm -hmm. did not have to be in the office. And I think just the difference in being at home and feeling seen, feeling heard, feeling celebrated in your household, and then the thought of having to return to a place, which is just the opposite. I think COVID also contributed to that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously we wouldn't have wanted anybody to suffer during that time, but it really did make people look back on their jobs at, and sit there for a month and think- yes. Do, I don't even want to go back there. Like, why, why would I do that? I'm, I spend most of my life at my job. Why would I want to spend it unhappy? So what do you think is the biggest, the biggest hurdle for, for black women? What is the biggest problem in your mind that they deal with? Yeah, I think it is. There are a variety of things. So first I think it is, it's, it's an interesting psychology. It, it's so many layers to it. And so one is you were hired for your expertise. You are hired for your knowledge. You are hired for the, the excellence that you bring to the work and your passion for the work. And then you come into this place thinking that you will be able to thrive and use all these things that you mm -hmm. were essentially hired to do. And at some point you reach that level of becoming a threat. And so you're doing good work and now you're a threat. And now it's met with racism. It's met with microaggressions. It's met with retaliation. When you speak up, it's met with micromanaging. And so there's this intersection of just so many things of like, wait, that's what you hired me for. You hired me to speak up. You right. hired me to do these things. And now I'm being penalized because someone didn't like the way I said it. They didn't like the tone that I said it in. And now it's open season. It's like every day I have to come and I say every day I have to come with my helmet and my hip pads on ready to protect myself because it's a war, it's a game and it's not set up for me to win. And so those are the things that people enter in. And so imagine waking up every morning, doing, enjoying the thing that you do, but not the place that you do it in and not mm -hmm. how you are treated. And so that presents a lot of layers of if I leave, what's going to happen to the people who depend on me? If I leave, what will happen to the services or to the programs that I lead? And so a lot of times as leaders, we serve as buffers and we're getting burned from both ends. We get burned from senior leadership and get burned from the fact that this is taking a toll on us emotionally and physically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It sucks that the job, a job can do that to a person, but it does yes. give me life sucking. Yes. Do you think that the human resources departments in general are equipped to deal with these kinds of touchy issues? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. And I think it just depends because there are a lot of different thoughts around that. First, that human resources is not there to protect the staff in the first place, that they're there to protect the company. And so if that is the premise, are you really there to serve me? And what does that look like? What is human resources protecting me look like? And does that even exist? Right. And a lot of times with 
this um, navigating rough seas is that there are things that happen underneath the surface that are undocumented. And so now, for example, I have to go to HR and say, you know, when I was just in that meeting with Don, Don threatened my job because I said this in a meeting. Where's the proof? It's my word against your word. Right. And if you've been there for 30 years and I'm new or I've been there for four years. And so that is the that is the the difficulty in navigating this. And that's what makes it even more dangerous and even more harmful because a lot of these things happen behind the scenes. It's very little that may happen in email or may happen in front of people. It's behind the scenes, but it's happening to multiple people behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And so how do we come together and say, no, there's no documentation of that, but that happened to me too. That yeah. person said that to me too. And so I think it's that, and it requires a sacrifice. And it's how many people are willing to sacrifice their finances, how many people are willing to sacrifice whatever favoritism they may feel like they have or that things are going kind of good for me because they're <laughs> focused on someone else right now. Right. It's like, do I want to really insert myself? But I think that that is the call. Like we have to be willing to sac to make that sacrifice and to take that risk and say, absolutely not. This is not okay. And it's happening and it's harmful because if it happens to me and I leave or I'm terminated, it still goes on because right. the mindset continues. That insatiable need to oppress and to be in charge and to, and to um, traumatize individuals still goes on. And so there's power in community. Yeah, for sure. So what is your advice just to take notes, um, document yourself whenever a situation happens until you feel like you've got a pretty good case or do you start asking other people, are you experiencing this? I mean, what do you do? I think it's a combination of everything that you just said. Take good notes, document as much as you can. Also find other individuals because most likely other people are experiencing in the workplace. And I think there are ways to kind of plant seeds to see how other people are experiencing it. A lot of times I say, there's a lot of there's a lot of words in silence. And so you see when certain people enter the room, even a virtual room, who sucks the air out and who gives it life. And it's like, OK, that person is affecting other people in that way as well. And so I think it's that um, one of the things I talk about in the book is having a pivot plan. And so you have two options, in my belief, that you either plan to leave or you plan to stay. And so if that environment is toxic, if you're planning to stay there are supports that you need. Your mental health therapist, you might need an attorney. Um, you need definitely things to do outside of work because that's the other dangerous part of this is sometimes people feel if they just work harder, if they just do more, that it'll be better. And that's actually the dangerous part of it because then you start to isolate yourself from your outside community, from your family, from your social circles. And there's no one there to bounce off ideas and say, no, that's just, that's really dysfunctional. That's really abusive. That's toxic. And also just to release it, just mm -hmm. to release it through exercise or through being in, in certain activities with friends or family or dancing or singing or painting or whatever you like to do, that is important to, to have as well. And so either planning to leave or planning to stay. If you're planning to leave, then there's some things that need to come together as far as what are your next steps? What direction would you like to go to? What type of resources or skills are needed? And how can you get those as you prepare to leave? And sometimes there's not a preparation. Sometimes it's just dangerous and it's just time to go. Right, right. And figure it out down the road. So how did you come up with your metaphor or the, the whole book, how it's talking about the under the, you know, the surface and water and all that, the seas? How did you come up with that? Yeah. So this is really interesting. I think it came to me in, a, in flight. I was on a plane and it's like, that's what it is. It's rough seas. It is that wave. It's being in the ocean and waves coming from all sides. And so it may be microaggressions. It may be racism. It may be someone coming and looking in your office and your files or meeting with your staff without you. And so it's a combination of things. Most of the time, it's not just one thing because then we would be able to compartmentalize it. Most of the time it comes from multiple things. And so 
thinking of being in the ocean and waves just coming from different directions, those are the rough seas. And then once I came up with rough seas, it's like, what could C stand for? And I knew it would be something related to soul eroding because I wanted to make sure that people knew that it's not just someone having a bad day at work, that it's not just another bad day at the office, that it is a slow erosion of your humanity, that is a slow erosion of your purpose and your power and who you are as a human being over time and what that does to you emotionally, what it does to you physically, what it does to your health. And so I wanted to make sure that I, I really was specific about that word. Also assimilation forcing, because a lot of times that's where the problem happens, that we hired you to do these things, but we want you to do it like this. We want you to say it three times. We want you to tilt your head to the side and say it with this tone. And so oh. every organization has a culture and there's the expectation that you will immerse yourself in that culture. And overall, if it doesn't impact your authenticity, it's like, okay, on Tuesdays, we wear our polo shirt with the name tag on it. Boom. But when it's like, no, you can't show up like that. You can't wear your hair like that. You can't say those words like that. Don't do that in front of those individuals. Don't say it like this. Now you start to make me question how, who I am as an individual and how I'm perceived. And now in addition to coming and showing up for this presentation, I have to think, do I want to wear my hair like this? Do I want to wear my shirt like this? How should I say it? Should I look people in the eyes when I say it? Should I look away? Should I use this word? Oh, maybe that word is too harsh. Maybe I should use. And so oh, the thing geez. that was fun has now become a chore. And even that starts to erode at people. And so I wanted that to be clear. And then systems that is happening in multiple places in different things. And, and it continuously happens like a system, ABC, ABC, or whatever that mm -hmm. um, collection of, of numbers or letters is that it happens in that it just continues to happen continuously until we intervene and, and say, this is not okay. And this is enough. It will continue to happen because it is a system. Yeah. Gosh. And when I read soul eroding, I was like, whoa, that's, that's really heavy. But when the way you just explained it, it is an erosion. It is a, mm -hmm. just a constant hit, hit, hit. And eventually you're like, I don't even know who I am anymore. I can't go to work and be like me. I can't dress like how I like to dress. I can't. That was a perfect way to word it. When you were writing the book, did you feel like like God was working through you? Like, did you, or did it just flow like that? Cause the way that you word things and you say it, it's just like, it came through you. Your hands are magic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So one of the things that came up is, is I always say I have a, a virtual vault where I just keep notes. And so those notes, a lot of times they come to me in flight. They come to me in the shower. They come to me while driving. They come three, four or five o'clock in the morning. And I just take notes. And so one of the things that our pastor always says is that you should have a, a place where you collect notes, where you, where you um, type out the downloads that have occurred, because otherwise you take for granted that the source that presented them to you has an obligation to repeat itself. And I'm like, oh, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. Like we're going <laughs> to write this down. And so I feel like those downloads came from God to me. And as I start to put this book together, it just, it just came together and it just started like just coming together. Even the model, like I have a seven waves of rough seas model in the book, even that the idea behind the model, the thoughts that came with each phase of the seven steps, I feel like that was a download from God. And it's, so funny because I have words, but those words are so much beyond my words to the point where wow. I just recently finished um, working with someone who did the audible voiceover for me. And so I have to listen to it and listen to it, make sure that it, yep. wherever there's errors, let her know timestamp. And so I'm sitting in my office and I'm listening to it like it's somebody else's book. And I'm like, <laughs> this is really good. And I'm like, well, you wrote that. And so I realized at, at, I think early on, I was caught up into, do I want to write this? Do I want to put this out there? What will people think of this? Do people even want to read it? And I had an epiphany 
And it was like, God spoke and like, this is not about you. This oh. is, you are a vessel that this is flowing through. Yes, this is your experience and you are, you are the vessel. And so you can tuck your stuff and get this book out there. And so I think <laughs> once I got that, it's like, okay, this is not about me. However I feel anxious, excited, fearful. This is not about you. Yeah. Get it out there. Like this is going to help other people heal. And so I think once that happened, it was like, no, I'm going to move into um, the first class and let God take this and lead me into how to write this. So I do feel like it is, it is something that is, is really beyond me. And it's still, every time I hear it, it's like, I actually wrote a book. Like I did that. Like, <laughs> wow. Okay. So I, I'm very proud of that. Yes. Oh, you should be. I really think it's such a big deal to write a book. It's because it is, you can get lots of really good thoughts and it's like, oh, I'll just jot that down. But to turn it into a 200, 300, whatever page, that's a lot of work. And yes. just to put it all together so it all makes sense and then find your person that's going to edit it and just to get it into production. I think it's amazing. So how has it been received? What are you hearing? Is, What's... Yes, it has been received really, really well. Like, I think it shocked me. I, I think I moved from the point where like, do people want to listen to this? Like, does this make sense to like, okay, it does make sense, but does it resonate with people? And to hear the feedback of like, thank you so much for, for creating this because you speak for so many black women in our experiences in the workplace. Like, thank you. Or people call like texting and calling and like today I took off the day off from work and I sat in the bed and read this book and this is spot on. Like, thank you. Or someone texting like, my aunt just read this and she called me at seven o'clock this morning. First thing this morning saying, let me tell you, this is what she wrote in chapter one and chapter two. This was my takeaway. And she's like, don't tell me anymore. I haven't even got that far yet. Don't tell me anything else. But she's like, and she sent me a receipt of her aunt buying five more books I love because that. she wanted other people to have it. And so just to see it resonating with people and them identifying other people that could benefit from this and sharing it or gifting it to people that has been really good. I love that. That gave me goosebumps. Do, do you feel like you could read it if you weren't in the workplace? Do you think you could read it and have it pertain to school, college, high school, whatever? I mean, does it pertain to just life? I think it is just life. I think there's two parts of it. There are things that happen in the workplace and there are things that happen to us in the workplace as we show up as individuals. And so there are things in there about kind of gathering yourself together, like emotionally and physically, and not that it will eliminate or prevent these things from happening in the workplace, but that you will be more prepared because emotionally you are entering in a place where you ex expect this so you come in prepared to respond and not to react. So I think it could be useful across the board, especially for college students, for individuals just entering the field. And I think also for high school students, I think that I, I'll share that as a black woman, one of the things that I grew up with was that if you go to school, you make good grades, you go to college and you just do these things, you will be okay. Like you will be able to make the income that you want to make, that you live in the community that you want to live in. And somehow you will graduate out of this space where you experience trauma at work or where you feel less valued. And so what I found is that that's not true. Mm -hmm. Like I went to school, I did well, I got my doctorate degree and I made good money and I still have to deal with this at work. So a part of me is like really mad, like this, <laughs> I did all these things and this didn't they happen. Said. And so they said, <laughs> and this didn't happen. Like, and so in the book, I talk about how in some ways we are not any better than our grandparents and great, great grandparents were. We have more financial um, means, we have more material things, but we are still experiencing the same abuse. And in a lot of ways, these material things have become trophies for navigating workplace abuse. And so really looking at it through that lens, I think it's a powerful lesson for parents of younger children mm -hmm. of really painting the picture that, yes, I want you to be all that you can be in life and excel. And at the same time, 
these things will still happen. And that's the, that's the sad truth. And so I think opening that up opens up a conversation about what's next. Do you want to go into the workforce? Do you want to really go to college? Do you want to become an entrepreneur? Like, what is that that you want to do and not this kind of path to this false sense of freedom that you just do these things and you will be okay? Because I think that's where a lot of harm comes from, that you've done all these things and you expect that you've graduated from this particular place and you get there and it's like you, you're you like, T-boned, like, wh right. whoa, what just happened? I just did this and this is what's <laughs> happening. So I think if we're able to have a realistic conversation about it, we can pre be prepared to either enter the workforce or be prepared to make a different decision about life and about how we want to have a livelihood and one where we feel seen and heard and celebrated and appreciated. Right, exactly. And it honestly makes me sick, full disclosure, that this is even a topic in 2024, you know, but I'm yes. glad you got to write your book. Nonetheless. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um. So what do you think is a good lesson? Be, be proactive. Is there anything else that you can share that would be like something to pass on to people if they are because like you said, it is somebody's paycheck and maybe they don't have the option to leave at this point. Mm -hmm. What is, how do they deal? How just, is it all, yeah. what do they do? Yeah. I, so it, it's two things I think. And that is something that I wanted to communicate in the book because I know everyone doesn't have the ability to leave. And so again, I think it comes down to those two things. Like either you're planning to leave or you're planning to stay but it's not an option to just be there because that's where the harm takes place. So you have to have a plan either way. So if you okay. are in a position where you, you have to stay for various reasons, create a plan that's going to help you thrive. And so even though work is toxic, who do you have outside of work? Who do you have in at your job that may be able to support you, that you may be able to go for a walk um, during your lunch break or take lunch together or sit in the cafeteria, sit outside together, where are those places in your community where they may be having pickleball or Zumba, mm -hmm. that's my thing. So Zumba, um, but that you can be in community with other people where if you like to read, where's there a reading club? And if you like to paint, where's their painting at that you can immerse yourself in community with other people and just be able to have some freedom outside of work and to be and able escape. to laugh and escape. Yes. And through those things, you may find networks of people who are looking for jobs. And now, you know, Sally that's in pickleball <laughs> has a job opening and you've been playing pickleball with Sally for two years. So how awesome would that be? Right. Um, so really, I think it, it's, it's that and looking at what do you need to do to be able to get out? Because I think that's the other thing, like the human body is is resilient and brilliant and all of these things, but it can only take harm for so long. And so right. we're seeing that in the data with heart disease and diabetes and um, depression and people dying by suicide that you can, you still, even with the plan, there has to be a plan to, to pivot, to do something different over the long term. It still has an effect on you. Right. You can't stay like this. So find a way to make a difference somehow, Correct. whether it's meditating and get your book, read your book. Yes. Yes. Go <laughs> like, take your vacation. Step one, read my book. Yeah. Read the book, <laughs> go on vacation, use your vacation time. Um, and I think that's another thing sometimes that we wear is trophies. Like, I just rolled over 200 hours in the yeah. Street. That's not cute. And who's giving awards for that? Like take your vacation and really turn off. Cause I think that is, is a lot of times too, where the harm comes in. These, some of these workplaces are dangerous and harmful and we could become one with them where it's like seven, eight, nine, ten 10 o'clock at night, midnight, after midnight, you're still doing work stuff, turn it off. Mm -hmm. And I always say work was here before we were born. It will be here when we long after we leave the earth, that checklist, you take two things off and five things come on, take time for yourself, prioritize yourself, go on vacation. If you cannot afford to go away, do a staycation, turn off your phone, separate your work from, from your personal phone, turn off your work computer and just do what makes your heart smile. And so I always say too, that 
sometimes doing nothing is something like doing nothing is something too. whether you decide I'm going to take five days off and three of those five days, I'm going to lay in my bed in my pajamas and watch <laughs> Netflix and funny yeah. movies. That is your business. Yay. Like do what makes you smile. <laughs> I love that. Yes. Don't ever feel stuck. There is no paycheck, no dollar amount in the world that is worth putting your body and your mind through all of Correct. that. There's just Correct. never, never a job title that is worth that to me. So are you going to write another all. book? Oh, that's early. I, 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 I'm <laughs> still, um, I think I'm still on the roller coaster of this one. Like it has been an amazing journey. And I think I need to just really breathe and take it like, and enjoy again, it. this is happy, enjoy it and just bask in it. And I've really enjoyed the journey. Um, but again, I feel like it was, I was a vessel for this. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to say I will never do it again because I want to be obedient. If God says, Hey, book two, let's go. It's like, okay, let me get out my notebook. <laughs> let's get it. And so, um, yes, I was, I'm not going to say never. I was right. for the moment that Just is enjoy not in it. my mind. Yes. I'm enjoying yeah. it. Well, and to bring it full circle, talking about how you're getting these downloads in the shower, that's when I do my best thinking too. And I think it's because I don't bring my phone into the shower. I am yes. there. It's just, you're there and you're forced to be present and people, everyone needs to listen to those messages that come in, the ideas that come in. That's when your mind is the most settled. And that's when action starts yes. happening, start paying attention to those messages because they can lead you into really great things. So absolutely. Yeah. I love it. It was such a pleasure talking to you. I just loved it. Tell everybody where they can find you and your book and all that good stuff. Yeah. So the book is available on Amazon. It is available in print verse, um, hard copy paperback, also ebook and also now in audible format. It is also available on my website and it is www.navigatingroughseas.com. And people are able to get the book in autograph format, well, get it autographed in both print form formats and also order bulk copies. There's also additional information about the services I provide. So I am a national trainer coach, um, healing circle facilitator, and also consultant. So I am here to provide service to individuals who may be navigating rough seas, but also organizations. That's another big thing. Organizations who I think sometimes try to sweep this under the rug and like, no, that's not happening here. Let me talk to your staff because <laughs> okay. they a lot of times have a different <laughs> perception of this. And so I'm here for that too, to provide organizations with a strategy, your strategies for healing. How do you create a place where employees look forward to coming and hate to leave? Not because they're forced to, or not because they're afraid to, but because they desire it, because they really want to. And so that that is the, the business that I am in. And that website can also be found under navigatingroughseas.com, also under Lead Us Well. And that is www.leid. O S W E L dot com. And so lead us well, and it's pronounced lead us well. And so that is the goal to help leaders learn well, lead well, and live well. I love it. I love that message. It was such a pleasure to meet you. You're just a beautiful human inside and out. I'm in your background too. <laughs> No, Thanks people that so are just much. listening can't see it. It's like all these beautiful, bright flowers. It's beautiful. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much. And I'll put everything in the show notes so people know how to find you. And I will definitely be in touch. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you for the opportunity, Don. And thank you for having this platform to even be able to have these types of conversations. So thank you for your work in cultivating this and creating and moderating this as well. Oh, thank you so much. All right. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care.